much. And thank you, Maru and Ben and Dean and Carolyn and everyone just for where's where's the I don't see Cheryl. She must be somewhere around here. Just just thank you for the invitation to share and to learn from all of you. So one of the things that has been most important for me in my in my life has been to be able to be around people. If you are a Barbara Streisand uh, fan, you know that song, People Believe People. That, that's me. That, that people are my lifeline. They really are the reason for what I do things. And I'm going to share with you some of the things that I've learned. Let me just tell you right now, I'm not an expert in many things. What I am, as many of the Puerto Ricans that are here, is a witness to what happens when governments fail, but also to what happens when the human spirit rises very high and does what we're supposed to do while we're on this earth, which is really just to love one another and take care of each other. Because if I see myself in you, and I don't care what color of the skin you are, what religion, who you love, if I look at myself in you, you've seen the movie Avatar, right? I see you, which means I see you. I don't want you to go without food. I don't want you to go without electricity for a year. I don't want you to be discriminated against because anything they do to you, they do to me. So all I'm gonna do tonight is share some of the things that I have been witness to some things that no one should be a witness to and just hope that they spark on you the voice that you have within that rule system that one thing bless you that it thing that makes you just want to move forward and make the world a better place somebody said this morning our students want to make uh what we're, we're with this caroline work so said our students want to make her, the world a better place and we just want to make sure that they have all the tools to do it. Um, I'm 60 years old. I know I don't look 60 years old. And from now on, whenever I say I'm 60 years old, all of you are going to say, but my God, you look so good. <laughs> so that's the test part of the like, so let's, I'm 60 years old. Wow. <laughs> Uh, and, and our generation did what they could, but we sure didn't get a lot of things right. That generation now has to clean up what we messed up. And you're in an institution that gives you the tools, but that opens your heart. I am amazed at the ability of all of you to be able to share what you know and to be able to engage in conversations to put that knowledge moving forward. So I'm like the no uh, land grant uh, ambassador here. <laughs> now, I'm sure if we think about it, we all have been in situations where we don't know how things are gonna turn out. Something unexpected that you never realized that something would happen. What you do know is that no matter what happens, nothing will ever be the same. You will never be the same. What you see and what impacts you will change you forever. That happened to me and to 3.5 at that time million Puerto Ricans who were on September 20th, 2017 in Puerto Rico. But it also happened to 6 million Puerto Ricans that live in the diaspora in the United States. The level of frustration that Mata was talking about was felt as a ripple effect all over the world. So you don't know what is going on. You don't know what is going to happen. Those that told you that they were going to be there to help you are there not to help you. Some people are more considering of the optics that are doing what needs to be done. Now, I was mayor of San Juan for five, eight years. In the last five years, we have to deal with this. What I am is a witness to what crises are all about. 
two new diseases, Zika and Chikungunya. Uh, anyone that has had dengue fever knows it's the same mosquito. Two coastal storms. The power of that wave is beautiful, but it just disrupts everything on its way. Political unrest, Puerto Ricans took to the streets in the summer of 2019, and after 14 days, ousted a governor in what was called the Pacific Revolution. There was bloodshed. Our students were um, hit with rubber bullets. Their heads were cracked. Their ribs were broken. Their limbs were, at some point, stressed. We, I know because we use City Hall as a sanctuary for all of the people that were being uh, put through the bloodshed. They never hid back. Once there was a video of somebody throwing a, a bottle of water that was made out of plastic back, back at a cup that was hidden. Them. But the power of the state was used to shut up people in 2019. After 14 days, the governor had to resign. We have two hurricanes, and uh, maybe somebody is going to have to help me with that slide. <coughs> ES is not where it's supposed to be. But two, two hurricanes, 6.0 and plus, which devastated and leveled most of the towns in the southern part of Puerto Rico. We have the COVID-19 pandemic as the rest of the world. And of course, we have two powerful hurricanes. That all happened in the span of five years well, I was mayor of the city of San Juan, and in the middle of that, I got a divorce. You can laugh. <laughs> in the middle of all of that, I got a divorce. And the reason why I tell you that is because one of the things we're going to find when we deal with people and with communities is what I call we all have a hurricane within. We all have something that is going on in our lives that we don't share with other people, that we don't tell other people but that it's really ripping us apart. And, and you have to, as a person that wants to be a leader, consider what the other person is going through if you really want to help them. Oops. I'm going to show you a few photographs. I think this is where we start. Of the devastation. This is a particular photograph uh, that I take to heart. This community called Quebrada Arenas in San Juan, very poor community, had waited 20 years for that basketball court to be inaugurated. We just opened the basketball court on July of 2017. Here comes Maria. And look, look, look at the sheer power. This is steel. The storm just engulfed everything, threw it, threw it out there. You can't see it, but at the top, over here, somebody climbed over there and put a Puerto Rican flag, kind of like in your face. You know, you may take that, but you're not going to take us. This is the amount of flooding in some of the towns in the internal part of Puerto Rico. And this goes also to the ripple effects of the crisis. You have the Alpha crisis, which is the hurricane, and then you have all the other crises that come about. There's no electricity, there's no water. If there's no water, you have a health crisis. Uh, if there's a health crisis, then you have an unemployment crisis, a food crisis. <laughs> you can have all the money in the world, but there is no food. Puerto Rico imports from 85 to 90 percent of all the food that we consume. There is no electricity. There is 3,000 cargo containers there where food cannot be taken out, literally. Just imagine living for months, that in front of your house. Hello. But look at that photograph. She has nothing except herself. And this is what the human spirit has to do. She has nothing except herself. And what she has, she's giving to her child. In a sense, that is a very sad photograph. And in a sense, it is a very powerful moment between that woman and that child. Now, one of the things that a crisis does is it magnifies inequalities, discriminations, injustice. 
I once said, and was very highly criticized in Puerto Rico, that we would no longer be able to hide our discrimination, our racism, our injustice behind palm trees and piña colados. The reason why I said that is because Puerto Rico lost about 30 million trees. And while you're driving on the highway, you look down and you see all those beautiful trees and flowers. You don't see the agony of the people who are disenfranchised and who really need government sometimes to get out of the way so that people can do what they do best. Now, there's a shift in perception of power when there's a crisis. Because when I've counted on you to come and save me and you don't show up, then I have no plan B. I have to save myself. I have to sing my own praises and figure out what I'm going to do. So when people were willing to minimize, to set aside, to look the other way, they cannot do that anymore. They are forced to confront the reality, the things that they lack, the things that the system has allowed them not to have access to. People start speaking up when the price of silence and the cost of silence is higher than the status quo. I wish it was different. I did it. I stayed quiet for three weeks. I tried to play the political good girl because I thought maybe if I do it that way, help will come. But I wasn't. And we were literally dying. Literally, people were gasping for air because their small generators were not able to support their, their systems. And then you have to answer one pivotal question in your life. What am I prepared to do? What am I prepared to do to change my circumstance and the circumstances of those around me? So people start embracing their role as change makers, as change architects, and change instigators. This is me when I was a member of the House of Representatives. We were protesting 30,000 employees being thrown out of their jobs uh, from the government. The government said that they were going to balance the budget by putting out 30,000 employees on the street. They never balanced the budget, and they ended up spending more in that that they would have spent on the payroll. Um, about half an hour later, I was beaten in the city hall uh, to the pulp, three cracked ribs, skull, torn ligaments on my left arm. And the only thing that I did was raise my hand and said, don't hit them. There were some students that were doing a protest and they were sitting. I, I stood in front of them and said to the cops, don't hit them, they're doing nothing. But <laughs> they hit somebody, not, not the student. Now, what, it, what is it that you do when you have nothing? <coughs> Your imagination cuts loose. All of a sudden, you're not restricted by what society said you should or you should not do. These are the women of Florida de Francia. And the kid of one of them. Before I talk to you about them, let me tell you a little bit about my own journey of how I knew I had to speak. <laughs> I'm very little. I have high heels on today. I'm about five feet tall weigh about 135 pounds. When I was small, um, I was very little, literally, bien chiquita. So I used to get roughed up in a playground a lot, um, you know, pushed around. One day, my grandmother came to pick me up, and I had a little bit of a cut lip and a little bit of a nose push. And she's like, what happened? Well, you know, did you start the fight? I said, no. I said, no, ma'am. <laughs> Did you finish the fight? And you know, I started doing that thing your lip does when it's going to quiver and signals that you're going to cry. And she gave me one of those looks like, don't do that. No. And she said, well, this is what you're going to do. 
because if you don't start a fight but you don't finish it, I'm going to whip you. <laughs> she was smaller than I was, but I did not want the wrath of that woman on me. Now, for the young man, oh, I forget his name. Ash. Ash. For the young man, we're not saying that this is the way you solve things. This was in the 60s. <laughs> it was a different time. We used to have these um, lunch boxes that were made out of steel with a thermos that had glass in it that was very thick and it would break. So she said, you're little, so you get one chance. This is what you're going to do. You're going to hit him as hard as you can with the lunchbox. You're going to run as fast as you can, and you're going to scream as loud as you can until you get to the teacher. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Soon enough, it happened. I did what she said. They called her to school. I'm sitting outside of the office of the teacher. She looked at me, she said, did you start the fight? No. And I said, but I finished it. <laughs> <laughs> we walk in and the teacher starts saying, I was a very good student. Uh, the teacher starts saying that she's surprised. And, and I don't know what's going on. Why did she do this? Blah, blah, blah. And my grandmother stood up four feet, maybe seven inches, and said, this is interesting. While she was getting plummeted, by that boy, nobody said anything. But the minute she stands up and defends herself, then she's the one that's wrong. Well, I think she has every right to defend herself. And you, go get your stuff. We're going for ice cream. <laughs> At that moment, she was the largest person to me. She gave me permission to speak up. She taught me that I had a responsibility to myself. But as we're walking out of the school, she said something to me that resonated many years later in that night before September 29th when I did that press conference where Milo probably heard about me for the first time. She said, you have a responsibility to take care of yourself but you have a duty to take care of others. So that duality, you use power to take care of yourself, but you have to use it to take care of others. That is what led me to do, I can swear to you, like God is my witness, that I heard her voice. Or maybe it was my voice repeating her words, you have to hit as hard as you can, you have to run as fast as you can. You have to scream as loud as you can. But then I was conflicted. And in my mind, I said, well, won't I be starting the fight? And my soul immediately answered and said, there are star fights that have to be fought. So you do what you have to do. That's not to say I didn't think of the consequences. And there were consequences, bomb threats, life threats. Um, going through TSA was a little difficult, depending on who the people were supporting. But I made that decision, and that's a choice that you all have to make at some point in your life. And it may not be a hurricane, it may be a divorce, it may be a family emergency, it may be a problem at work. You have to decide what you're prepared to do. When is it enough for you to shake something inside of you that you maybe didn't know was there, and you have to move forward? So while we're going through the city of San Juan, I meet this woman, Lucy, in the middle. She comes right up to the car. I'm, I'm trying to, there. She comes right up to the car. She says, Mayor, Mayor, we need your help. We live over there. We don't have any food. And I said, I'll, I'll be there. She says, no, we need your help. Rates her voice. We need your help. We don't have any help. I'll be there. I was getting annoyed. <laughs> she turned around, flattened my face, and she says, we know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned around and I said, I said, I'll be there. <laughs> so I walked over there, because they obviously know where I lived. <laughs> <laughs> and they had put together the most amazing system. 
they lived on a project, they still do, and they had gone home by home doing the good old grassroots that we were talking about, knocking on the doors and saying, give me all the food that you have. And they put together a community soup kitchen. They picked up the debris and, I mean, poor, poor Ben, there was no, no food safety here. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, but people have to eat, you know. Uh, and and they, they said, but the problem is we don't have enough food. We're running out of food. Because I had screamed as hard as I can, people had started sending, the Hispanic Federation sent 200,000 pounds of food. Goya sent us 200,000 pounds of food from Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, New York, um, the California, Chicago. People were sending food and more food and more food. We would give out about half a million to a million pounds of food a day to people. So what I learned over here is that you are going to find leadership in the most unexpected places. Because we think about leaders as the ones that are on the 6 o'clock news, right? The ones that then rather or, or you know, uh, somebody interviews. Uh -uh. There are more leaders in amongst our farm workers that are informal leaders that really are the ones that could get other people to take that additional extra step. We just have to be able to recognize. This is a video that I hope I can play. Um, it, it doesn't have good resolution because it's from my cell phone, but we did a little caption because, because of them, we ended up doing the same model that they did, and they became our trainers for 26 more community kitchens all throughout San Juan, all run by women. The municipality would take the food to them every three to seven days, and they would feed people in an appropriate manner. Um, I think Cheryl was talking about when we feed each other, but we feed each other with our comfort food, with the food that we know that reflects our values on our system. Well, let me see if I can play this out. So they have a community kitchen, which they put together. And I just happened to come across them a few days ago. And rather than taking a little portion and a little portion, they have the ability to cook for 200 families lunch and dinner, just with wood. So they didn't wait for anyone to help them get. They took everything that they had in the community, they put it together, and they, they did a makeshift restaurant.
and they have continued to work together. Now they do advocacy for people not to be thrown out of their apartments without a formal process and a legal process and giving people aid. So, so crisis is like the tip of the iceberg, right? You, you get to move along and do things that you thought you were never going to do. Now look at the difference. This is what FEMA thought was food. That is what they gave us about two months after the hurricane. It's a mess. <laughs> Other thing is that they would give you 20 little boxes and then leave. And in those boxes, the beef jerky was called an entree. This is what the women of Torre de Francia were able to provide. When the government was the platform for them to do their agenda in the manner in which their community saw fit. It's quite, quite a difference. Now, the, the lesson learned for me was that collaboration with the community increases power, and that increases democracy. Now, what that means is that we have to have a different type of political leadership that understands that power is not to be held, but power is just to be exercised. In Spanish, we say, el poder es para poder. Power is to be able to. You use power to be able to. Another lesson learned is uh, the, the enriches community. One of the things that we did is we started noticing that the more we have done participatory budgeting in San Juan, um, we have done social contracts where I would sit with the community, they would tell me what their agenda was, I would agree to it, and then they would have in black and white papers signed by me a sworn statement that said, this is what we're going to do. This is how much it's going to cost, this is the time frame of how much it's going to be. But we noticed after the hurricane that there was an opportunity here to create or to, como se dice, que suba la superficie. Emerge, emerge. To, to, to allow the natural leadership of the communities to emerge. And when I'm saying that, I have to correct myself. Governments don't allow. Governments need to respect the natural leadership. So I still have to even catch myself, right? Because I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> so I, I have to catch myself when I, when I say those things. Now, we started putting together this, what we call Centro de Transformación Ciudadana y Comunitaria, Centers for Community and Citizenship Transformation. We would take an old building and we would sit, it's, uh, turn it into a command center totally solar powered with obviously solar batteries for people to be able to um, to plug in their their cell phones. Manu, tú me haces un favor, tú me das mi iPad. I just want to show you something Puerto Ricans will recognize. Yes. <laughs> when you have no electricity for a year, you don't need electricity to be able to take a hot shower. You want it to be able to operate in an operating table without the light on your cell phone. One of the things that we used the most was this little thing, it's called a solar puff. This one does not have any solar anymore. Uh, and this gives you 91 lumens, and we would give one per family, and the families could go ahead and use them. People didn't have anywhere to go. So they would stay inside their homes, and as the days went by, depression started taking over. We could really see the faces, the, the looks, the day's looks. We had a first aid kit, so we had to train people in order to ensure that they could become health uh, assessment. They could say, you know, why, 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 is you, why are you looking so fresh? Well, I am taking my medicine. Why? No, it's my insulin. 
is not good because I lost, there's no power, so my insulin isn't working. And one of the important things, like I said, people would go and write the station for the cell phones. These are the group of women that run. This is a municipal employee that uh, now works uh, with, with me in the foundation that we just started last month. These women run that center in an equitable way. It is amazing how the issue of equity, we were talking today also about the issue of equity, comes into every community that has to deal with a disaster. And the thing is that this is a platform for then other things to take place. Now this were the two signs of power in that center. Cecilia, who was the leader, always had the bullhorn. And whoever she gave the bullhorn to then had the power. But the ultimate sign of trust from the municipality to them was this radio. This radio allowed them to make a decision to decide when I'm going to call the emergency management system to summon an ambulance to come to my community. They didn't have to call a doctor. They didn't have to call a nurse. They would decide amongst themselves, do we need this service right now? Because this is a short circuit radio system that we developed so that they could do that. Once, between 2017 and 2020, the system was used by the seven centers that we opened. One person was having a heart attack. So the idea that we give power, people will abuse it. It's, in my experience, it's, it's really not true. People will use it, and then some politicians don't like that. Because there is nothing that a politician fears more than people that can think, and people that know their worth. Nothing that they feel more. Cesar Chavez used to say, once social change began, begins, it cannot be stopped. You cannot educate a person that learns how to read. But people have to know. Cesar Chavez in that statement is right. But with that Dolores Huertas telling everybody, mm -hmm. si se puede, mm -hmm. and making sure that people understood that yes, they could that there is something inside each and every one of us that can be awakened. We just have to be on board, on boss, unafraid, fearless in the commitment to pursue what we think is a better life. And how do we know it's a better life? Well, if it includes, if it opens spaces of collaboration, if it provides people more rights, if it allows them to take care of decisions about their own body, then but if it excludes, if it divides, if it pins us against one another, then something's not going to work there in the long run. Community power, community led, community operated, those work. <laughs> That's what I learned as a man. People ask me, so how do you feel leading? I don't feel like I led anyone. People will let you lead them if you follow them. If you follow them. If you are a reflection of the sum of their hopes and their aspirations. That is different than you being the center. And I understand there's a dichotomy. At some point, I had to be the face of everything that we needed. But I was able to do that for two reasons. One, the reporters that went there saw the same thing that I did. And two, what I was saying resonated in the hearts and souls of people. So I was really just talking as loud as I could, as my grandmother taught me to do. I also learned this, this lesson. 
which is very important to me. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. We're trying to see something. And I'm going to take one minute, and with your indulgence, and speak directly to the women in the audience. We are taught that we ask for help. We're weak. And our mistakes are magnified even more. Just while I'm saying this, the air has been sucked out of the room. <laughs> but it is the truth. So don't ever be afraid to make a mistake. Uh, this morning, I was saying 42 times Lincoln ran for president before he got elected. I think it was 119 times that Edison tried the light bulb before it got done. Don't be naive. There will be a price to pay, but then you decide if you want to pay that price. The other thing is, don't be afraid to lead with your heart. This goes for everybody in the room. We are taught that there's a contention between leading with my heart and leading with my head. There's no contention. Somebody asked me, why is this so personal to you? And my answer was, why, why isn't it personal to you? Why isn't it personal that people are tied? You see, 3,000 Puerto Ricans did not open their eyes today. That's 6,000 eyes. Brothers, sisters, mothers, granddaughters, and they did not have to die. There was no reason for those deaths. They died because somebody thought our lives were expendable, that our lives were worth less than others' lives. This does not have to happen anywhere. While we're sitting here, there are people, maybe even in rally, without enough food, without enough health care, workers without the paperwork necessary to be able to afford them the opportunity to have a different life in this country. And it's all about people. It's simple. We complicate it. But it truly is all about people and about where we're going to respect one another and about the legacy that we're going to leave for that young man to grow into. Think about the world we live in. It takes young people months, tons of essays and paperwork to get into college, but you can walk into a gun shop and get an assault rifle in 15 minutes. It's a decision that we make. It doesn't have to be that way. We didn't have to die. And I don't care if we die in Puerto Rico, we die in Harvey, or we die in the forest in California, or we die in an apartment in New York City. It doesn't have to happen. Think about what you want about the queen. Let's not get into the monarchy versus the non -monarchy. Recognize that you don't have to be born a queen to be one or a king to be one. This woman was playing in her backyard with her sister when all of a sudden her uncle fell too much in love left the throne, her father became king, and she became heir to the throne. That was not what she was born to do, but it was her destiny. And I know what you may think, well, Julie, you were mayor of San Juan, you know, you have a position of power. You all have a position of power. If somebody's getting picked on while you're in line because you're a transgender person, you have the power to say, you know what, stop it. Not on my watch. That's not going to happen on my watch. But you have to make that decision. You have to decide what price are you willing to pay. And I've learned that in positions and in situations like this, there's only two choices. Only two. You stand up and speak up, or you shut up and become complicit to a narrative that will make a human being feel less 
Na branca. It may be a hard choice. It may have consequences. But it is your choice. So let's not always look for the leader in the 6 o'clock news. Let's look for the quiet leader that knows what needs to happen on each community. Communities are filled with people that do what they're supposed to do and even more. And I honestly have come to believe and understand that it is by making our communities thrive, not survive, thrive, that we will change the world and make it a little different. If you don't remember anything that I say tonight, remember this, it's about people. That's all we're here to do. So when you're in this university and you think about food sustainability, yes, it is about the mechanics and the chemistry and the way that you move the crops. But it's about feeding people. And when you think about compost and you think about biogas, it is about giving people a better opportunity. And when you think about community engagement or about making sure the farm workers are healthy and have what they need, it is about people. It is that simple. I'm going to finish with something my father and my mother used to do. In my family, people were very intentional about showing us the interconnectivity amongst human beings. What in quantum physics they call entanglement. Once a year, my father would wake my brother and I at four in the morning and would scream, Arriba corazones! And I was like, wake up hearts. And I went, uh. <laughs> there were two rules. You had to wear a t-shirt, no shirt, no jacket, t-shirt. I know what you're going to say. It wasn't cold in Puerto Rico. <laughs> and number two, you couldn't have anything for breakfast except water. They would drive us to the side of the road where there were workers farming. And at 6 o'clock in the morning when the whistle would blow, boom, my mother would take one of those huge thermos, would give us each, my brother and I, half a thermos cup of coffee and a little slice of bread. And she would say, and my mother has Alzheimer's now, so whenever I think of something that she says, I get a little touched. She would say, just think that the food that you put on your table, it's the result of that work. And if you had been out there in the field, you would have been already working two or three hours with no food in your stomach. So be grateful for what you do. If we learn something during COVID, it is that those workers that are at those farms are more essential than all of us. Because they fed us throughout all of that. So you have a choice. You can look at the world through all this, you know, this, all this thing is wrong. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that is wrong in the world. Or you can look at the world through the eyes of people that every day go out there and try and make it better in our communities. How many women have given birth here? Where did you give birth? Where? Birth center. But, uh, oh, here in Raleigh. In Raleigh? Raleigh, Oregon, and Massachusetts. Puerto Rico? Atlanta. I love that. Anybody Florida. in the back? Florida. Florida. Chicago. Canada. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Canada. I guarantee you we felt the same pain. <laughs> <laughs> because when, you know, a six inch circumference is coming out of a <laughs> 10 centimeters, it's going to hurt the same way. But we somehow. We somehow find joy in dividing ourselves. Or you're black, or you're white, or you have glasses, or you're gay, or 
You know, what the? Do you think Irma and Maria and Zika and Chikungunya and the two earthquakes and the two coastal storms and financial bankruptcy really ask who the hell did you vote for to see if I'm going to screw up your home? No. And this, this thing that we're all on the same boat, we're not on the same boat. We're on the same space. Some people have yachts. Some people have jolas, I don't know, out of dinghies. Some people have a boat. So in anything that we do, equity has to come into place. For as long as I live, anyone that listens, I will say this. My grandmother was wrong. You have to start the fight. You have to ignite the fire in a metaphorical sense. You have to do everything you can every day to make the world a little better. And the world for you may be the two feet where you're standing on. You don't have to have the Big Bang Theory. You don't have to be in the 6 o'clock news. But you have to answer your own call to service. From wherever you are. Because if you don't do it, people will die. People will die a senseless death. And there are more than a million people that die from COVID. 3,000 Puerto Ricans that died from a much effort that did not have to take place. More did not die because our communities stepped up to the church, bless you. It is that simple. Now, for as obscure as it may seem, there is something about humans that really makes us work with one another when push comes to shove. If you are a racist, and you have had cancer, you have probably been saved by a black woman named Henrietta Lacks, who cells were the first cells to be able to reproduce in a laboratory. Imagine that. A black woman, uneducated Henrietta Lacks, was taken those cells from her body, unbeknownst to her, she didn't get permission, they reproduced, and the entire system, the entire system of most of the medications of cancer come from that reality. So you can be all the racist you want, but here's a black woman whose cells are taking care of you. Or are you going to refuse brain surgery for your son or your daughter just because the only person that can do it as a gay surgeon? No. Because we know what's good for us. I, I want to just impart this on you one last time. 3,000 people. 3,000 people. And it hurts every day. I wish I would have eaten a little less so I could share another meal. I wish I could have slept a little less so I could save another life. I wish I didn't have that burden. I don't wish that burden on you. So make the most of every day. Do everything you can to empower your communities to make sure that if people leave the earth, as we all shall leave at some point, they do it with the dignity and the respect that the being humans deserve. You are at a great institution. Take advantage of it. And think of the entanglement between us. Think about it. 
because there is no bigger power in the world than a community that is engaged, a community that understands what they want, and a government that gets out of the way and lets people do what they're here to do, which is to thrive and not only to survive. So say it with me, it's all about people. Say it again. It's all about people. Say it like you mean it. It's all about people. Come on, just say it. It's all about people. Thank you very much.